Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Knight Studio and uh, to the museum. And welcome to those of you watching the live stream. I'm Gene Polisinski. I'm Chief Operating Officer of the Museum Institute. On behalf of my colleagues at the Institute, at the museum, and at the Freedom Forum, welcome to what I think is an amazing time, an amazing afternoon. We're going to be talking about one of the essential uh, elements, I think, of our society today and how can we rebuild trust and, and determine trust in journalism and in, in facts and in the truth. So we're very pleased to partner with the Truth Project uh, on what is uh, the uh, part of their uh, debut uh, of their work, and uh, we'll have a panel discussion of what uh, uh, the Trust Project and really the, the hope, I ho what I, I'm hopeful of how we can deal with the dilemma of junk news. Uh, so we're going to have an afternoon where we'll have a presentation uh, by the Trust Project by Sally Lerman, who is the director, and, and then uh, we'll look at what the work of the Museum Institute's Museum Education Department is. And then we'll move to a panel discussion. But we have uh, some presentations and other opening comments. So let me introduce Kirk Hansen, who is Executive Director of the Markula Center for the Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University, home of the Trust Project. Uh, he's an emeritus professor at Stanford Business School, where he taught for 23 years, I believe, uh, before going to Santa Clara. He's one of the early pioneers and the leaders in the field of business ethics. And he's grown the Markula Center into the largest university-based ethics center on the planet, I believe. Why not say that? So it's truth. It's a fact. So with that, Kirk, thank you very much. Thank you, Gene. We're very grateful uh, to be here at the museum. Thank you to all of your colleagues and, and you for partnering with us in this launch of the Trust Project. Uh, the Markula Center for Applied Ethics uh, is pleased to act as the host institution uh, for the Trust Project, and I'm the executive director of, of the uh, Markula Center. The Trust Project grew out of a dialogue amongst digital journalism editors that uh, we, or I should say Sally Lehrman, my colleague, uh, our director of journalism ethics, convened uh, for about three years. And then three years ago after that, they decided together, the journalism, digital journalism editors, to uh, launch what has now become the Trust Project. Uh, the the Markula Center is, is a bit of a unique institution. We work in multiple fields of applied ethics, not just journalism ethics, but we have experts like Sally in, in fields including business ethics, nonprofit ethics, medical ethics, government ethics, K through 12 character education, uh, and being in Silicon Valley, a very heavy dose of technology and ethics and its multiple uh, expressions. Sally Lehrman uh, is one of our stars, is an award-winning journalist for her writing uh, in a variety of fields, uh, and uh, more recently on diversity and trust in the news. She was a Knight Fellow at Stanford, a Knight Professor of Journalism and Society at Santa Clara University, and I convinced her to join the Markula Center, one of the best decisions that I ever made. So we're delighted to have you here to join us uh, for this uh, discussion of the Trust Project uh, and the launch of this very important endeavor. I'd like now to turn it over to Sally Lehrman. Thank you very much, Kurt, for that kind and generous introduction. And we can go ahead and start the slides, please. So as a science journalist for magazines, public radio, and newspapers, I know I've driven some editors crazy with my attention to detail. One of them sitting right there, Barry Scott. I know how important it is to get the story right, to frame a new development and the, its importance, or lack thereof, accurately. So when I brought the executive round table for digital journalism ethics to Santa Clara University, to the Markless Center, I was troubled by what I heard. There was deep concern that search engine optimization, the push for clicks, was undermining accuracy, was undermining careful news selection, was undermining ethics. So I thought, something has to be done. Could we flip the picture? Could we make technology a support? for quality instead of a support for cat videos? Could we use these algorithms, these things called algorithms at the time I was thinking, toward good? So Richard Gingras, who was on the executive roundtable at the time and who you'll 
hear from in a bit, was one of the first technologists that I consulted and asked, well, can't we, can we flip this picture? Can we turn this around? And he said, yes, it can be done. And he agreed to work with me on this project. And I also talked to um, Craig Newmar, who immediately got the idea and helped agreed to fund the effort. And the Markless Center, and specifically Kirk, really saw the importance. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is tell you about this little idea that I had, how this little idea I had grew in some, into something powerful and important. Today, it's apparent that those editors were right to be concerned. You've probably seen this um, data before, which is the uh, Pew Research Center, actually it's a Gallup poll that shows the, the decline in trust in news. Has, and the trust in news has reached its all-time low at 32% since they started measuring it. And at the same time, we're in an environment right now where there are real active efforts to undermine trust in the news and to sow mistrust. And we have a public that wants to be informed, genuinely wants to be informed, but is uncertain. As, as Wendy says here, she was one of the people we interviewed, news is there to tell us what's going on around the world, around the neighborhood. But I'd like for it to be more real, not just selling a viewpoint or person. So the idea of the Trust Project is can we, now that people are getting their news on the screens in this digital environment, can we pull back the curtain on the due diligence that goes into trustworthy journalism? What are the elements of trustworthy journalism and can we put them right on the page? And then also, since most people are getting their news off of social or search, can we provide signals, these same indicators, to the news distribution platforms such as Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Bing so that they can then elevate quality journalism out of the hubbub? So this is the result. I'm um, proud to announce that this week, newsrooms in Europe and in the US have gone live with these trust indicators. So there are nine newsrooms that have actually gone live with transparency standards that will be shown to the public and also signal to the news distribution platforms, plus a WordPress plugin that enables other news organizations that maybe don't have those kinds of resources to participate. This, so here's an, these are some of the news organizations that are participating. So let me tell you a little bit about how it got started. We began with talking to the public, to un trying to understand what is it that people really value in the news? What are they looking for? When do they trust it? When have they lost their trust? We talked to people in Europe and the US across race, class, gender, generation, and geography. And these are the kinds of things that we learned. People said, we understand that you journalists try to be objective, but everyone has an agenda. So what's your agenda? Who is this journalist? What is their expertise? People wanted to have a relationship with this journalist. Sorry, I can't see my own slides. Um, oh, diverse perspectives. People wanted to hear from people who were not just in business, high level in people in business and government. They wanted to hear from people who are like themselves and people unlike themselves. They wanted to hear um, from a variety of perspectives. They also wanted in this digital environment to be able to participate. So there was a feeling we need to have the opportunity to engage in the process of news gathering in, in terms of actually setting that agenda that they were talking about. So as a result, we had came up with this, these trust indicators. And they are best practices, which are what naming the policies behind the publication. So what are your ethical standards? What's your commitment to accuracy? What's your commitment to corrections? Who owns you? What is your commitment to diverse voices and bringing them in? Author reporter expertise, type of work, your methods, your citations and references. So how is the story built in the, in the cases of in-depth stories or maybe investigative stories or maybe more controversial ones? Local, people wanted to know if there was a local expertise behind the story or if the story was in their locality. And then again, diverse voices and public engagement. So here we see some examples of how these news sites are using them right now. 
uh, La Republica there, that page has the code of ethics and then it shows all their policies below that. And at the very top, you can't see that, but there's a little trust mark symbol. It shows that they are part of and participating in the trust project. The middle one is the economist showing those citations and references. It was on a story about rich witchcraft that ran on Halloween and just had a really great little story. And then underneath is where they got the information. Mike, there's an example there of right on the article page, you can get information about the author, so that author's expertise as well as their body of work. And in addition to all these news sites showing these, it's um, dozens of news sites represented by these nine companies, we have Google, Facebook, Bing, and Twitter all agreeing to use them in whatever way makes more, most sense for their environment, in display or in their algorithms. How did it come together? Well, to me, this is an amazing, um, the most, most amazing part of this project. We had leaders from 75 news organizations working closely together to decide what these trust indicators should be, listening to the public, and then connecting those with traditional journalistic values and coming up with some proposals in that area. And then we had summits to think about, okay, what are the most important ones? 15 news organizations worked together on this first phase of technical implementation. So those are news organizations that had people in development, people in user design, met together every week to think about how are we going to actually make this real. And I want to put Subu Vincent's name up there. He's sitting in the back. Raise your hand. Because Subu uh, shepherded that process along. Schema.org helped the community there helped us come up with the technical vocabulary so that they, they actually, these would be machine readable. And the tech platforms helped us with that as well. And then the News Leadership Council was a guiding body that helped make decisions about how and when these should be used and what are the principles behind them. So this effort is a, quite a different effort than any other out there right now or before because one, it is this massive collaboration of news organizations really responding to the public. And what we're providing is not a stamp of approval, but something that people can use to make their own assessment of the quality behind a piece of news. And it turns out, I'm going in the wrong direction here, turns out that it actually seems to work. So we put an experiment together with um, the Engaging News Project, and they did an experiment where they invited 1,000 people to look at the trust indicators and they were randomly, they were to look at a news page and they were randomly assigned to either a page with the trust indicators or a page without them. And then they did a survey getting to get a sense of how people responded to them. And let me just show you the preliminary results. This is essentially what it looked like, a sample of what it looked like. So you can see on that page, you have information about the author, you have whether the label, is it news, analysis, opinion, or what. You have a little Trustmark logo that will link to the best practices page where you get information about ethics, et cetera. There are also citations and references and methods on that page. And these are the results which actually were astounding. So people who were able to see the trust indicators reported that much stronger attitudes about the reliability of the news sites, about whether they felt it tell the, told the whole story, and other elements behind trustworthiness. They also felt that those sites were more likely to have a commitment to, to in-depth reporting or to real reporting practices. And they expressed a feeling that this news site was being transparent with them. So the, these attitudes also translated into specific behavioral differences, which also to me was very exciting. So people who saw the trust indicators or knew that they would be there felt that was more, they were more likely to seek news from that same site. They were also more likely to talk to their family and friends about the article itself. They were in fact, they were interested in paying to be able to have access to, to news stories from the news beat. So these are the top trust indicators in terms of performance. And you can see the, the initial, the most popular one, that, which was about 60% um, elevation in trust, was just being a part of the trust project. And then in addition to that, people were 
um, moved by the presence of things like um, the best practices, the um, who is on the masthead, so who, what is the leadership behind the organization, and then also the, the labels. So what's next for the Trust Project? Well, we have this first phase launch, which I'm just so excited to see happening. We're going to assess how people actually respond to the real page. We're going to um, put together a second phase launch, also controlled. And then the most important thing is to bring it back to the public to bring it back to the people who helped start this picture and encourage people to actually own these, use them in their own way, and spread the word. So ultimately, my hope is that through this work, we really can restore the trusted role of the press in the news. So again, this is an unprecedented collaboration amongst normally very highly competitive, highly independent news organizations who are stepping forward to meet this moment. So to me, it's just so exciting, and I want to express my gratitude to all the people who did this work, which is over 100 people, I would say, if I really counted them up. Many of you are here today, so I thank you, and I thank the, the rest of you for listening. And I'm sure we're going to have a chance to talk more about those and also about the, um, the overall context of these indicators and how they go forward. First, I'd like to introduce Catherine Kosen, who is a museum educator here at the museum, and she will take us through the museum education department efforts to address misinformation and to enhance media literacy. So welcome. Oh, is that the first one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So thank you, everyone. So the museum education department has been teaching about media literacy for years, but following the 2016 election, you know, we began to focus more on, especially on creating resources related to the problem of fake news in response to requests from teachers in our community for ways to help them address this hot topic in the classroom. So, let's see. Yes, okay, so uh, we began uh, with, uh, we created in March a fighting fake news class that kind of delves into the basics, the what exactly is fake news? Uh, what, why is it happened? Why is it a problem? How do I identify it? And this class uh, we, has already become our by far most popular class for on-site groups. And we also began offering it online in September for groups that can't make it here in person. Already since March, on-site and online, we've taught this to about 1,500 students. So definitely the demand for this kind of training is out there in mean, classrooms. See a picture there of the class. Uh, at the same time, we have created and released two infographic style posters about that help students and adults alike evaluate information in order to hopefully ha have them think before believing it or sharing it online. So on the left side, you can see our escape junk news poster which provides a handy acronym that people can use to remember some key aspects of media that they should be considering before, you know, necessarily believing information or judging its quality. You know, evidence, source, context, audience, intended audience, the purpose, how it was executed. And uh, this, we use the phrase junk news here because we realize that it's not just false news that's a problem, right? This can also help people evaluate sloppily reported news or biased information, right? All these other things that are also undermining trust in news. I have to say, though, definitely these trust indicators would help make an easier job of using these letters to evaluate the news. Um, on the right side, we have a Is It Shareworthy poster that gives some steps, a flow chart to help people think a little bit about whether something is really worth passing on. You know, studies show that nearly 60% of links are on uh, Twitter, social media are shared without even being opened. So just getting people to pause a moment and think before sharing could be an important way to help cut down on information that's inaccurate. And we recently entered into a partnership with Facebook to help get our these posters and resources out in front of a broader audience. So since uh, last month, actually, 
uh, we have had over 3,000 downloads of these posters uh, through, after, through their ad campaign. So definitely, again, the demand is out there for this kind of training. And we also continue to, and we're also going to translate those posters actually into other languages with the help of Facebook to further our international reach. Now, we also are continuing to update more timely resources about media literacy on our website, museumed.org. So if you go to the website, it's easy. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see media literacy and get this stack page. Although soon in early, in December 7th, we'll be coming out with a new media literacy booster kit uh, in partnership with the American Association of University Women. And uh, these are all free resources too. Free to download these posters. Uh, we're also printing them and handing them out. In fact, actually, if you're interested in these posters, the uh, Shareworthy poster you can pick up on the table out there. And also, we made a bookmark of the Escape poster that you can also pick up. And finally, I just want to note that we do really think that media literacy education is the answer, the best solution for trying to fight this fake, this junk fake news problem. You know, uh, especially as an, a group, an organization that advocates for the First Amendment, we realize the, that top-down solutions to fake news, whether from the government or social media, can threaten free expression. We've seen a lot of examples of how uh, algorithms and technological fixes can sometimes, you know, be ineffective or incomplete, even with the best of intentions. So, for example... Uh, if you haven't heard about it, Perspective was a tool released by Google earlier this year to help moderators uh, be able to identify toxic comments that would make people want to leave the conversation. Uh, but inadvertently, you know, it's still in development, but it would, people realized it was uh, identifying things like I'm a gay black woman as a more toxic statement than stuff like the Holocaust never happened. So again, showing you know, how you know, much work some of these algorithms need and how sometimes you know, human touch is necessary. And then we also, you know, with like Facebook, where they have the tagging system now with fact checkers to try to tag disputed posts and how you know, that was found to only increase the ability to identify a fake post by 3.5%. Now, it also supposedly helps slow down the virality of these posts, but there's only so many that can be addressed by fact checkers. On the other hand, uh, media literacy education, oops, sorry, uh, media literacy education though has also been proven to be successful. So like uh, a study of American students who got it, uh, were, they were 26% more likely to be able to identify a post that was um, fact-based or evidence-based, even if it went against their political leanings. So in this partisan world, that could be very important. This can help people understand the information. So thank you again. In short, we think empowering news consumers is the answer. Thank you. some additional chairs uh, for those of you in the back. You can fill in a table if you want. Feel free to do that. Come on in. Thank you. Well, welcome again. We're glad to have you here. And we're glad to hear about uh, the Trust Project and to, I think, have a discussion on the, the larger issue, really, uh, that was outlined both in Sally's comments and my colleague from Museum Ed about uh, rebuilding trust and finding a way to empower consumers. And I think that's really what we're, what we're all about, one of the things that regardless of where the, the projects start or stop, we're all about telling people, here's how you can, re once again, uh, use your own uh, assessment tools, your own abilities to determine uh, what you should put your faith in out there. And, uh, and we're all challenged, I think, by the change in that uh, uh, disruptive environment of news from the time that uh, I knew exactly in the morning what I was going to get when I woke up. The morning newspaper, an afternoon newspaper, a couple of uh, two or three networks uh, in the evening, and uh, national dailies and local dailies. So let me introduce the panel 
uh, that we have here quickly, my colleague Lata Nott, who is Executive Director of the Museum Institute's First Amendment Center, offices here and at the John C. Butler Center at Vanderbilt. Uh, Lata was a former, uh, formerly the Assistant Director of Admissions at Georgetown University Law School, uh, Law Center, a litigator in New York City at two law firms, uh, Proskauer Rose and Chad Burnham Park, uh, and developed expertise in issues around the internet, data privacy, cybersecurity, uh, working on the uh, blog, technology blog there. Um, we have Craig Newmark, uh, who is a web pioneer, a philanthropist, an advocate, uh, really a, a strong advocate on behalf of trustworthy journalism. He's also in a interested in a variety of issues from voting rights and veterans and military families, social justice. Um, in 2017, he was the founding funder and uh, executive committee member of the News Integrity Initiative at uh, CUNY Graduate School. Uh, but uh, also the, the Craig Newmark Foundation to promote investment in organizations that effectively serve their communities and draw really broad civic engagement, I think, across the range of issues at a grassroots level. And uh, quite honestly, Craig, I have to say, I was looking to see if I could name some of the organizations we're in. I gave up because he's engaged in a number of uh, boards and uh, advisory boards of nonprofits that uh, really work to make our society better. So it's, it's really good to have you here. Um, Corey Hike is the publisher of Mike, the online news organization founded in 2011 and oversees the editorial product and analytics and driving what is truly adaptive journalism, I think cutting edge uh, platform for sharing the news, sharing in Pulitzer Prizes with the Times-Picayune, the coverage of Hurricane Katrina for breaking news and public service in 2006, uh, Pulitzer, shared in Pulitzer in 2010 with the staff of the Seattle Times for coverage there of uh, the tragedy of four police officer shootings and uh, uh, was executive director of for emerging news products at the Washington Post and holds a master's of arts degree from the University of Milwaukee. Uh, and R Richard Gingras, uh, who has been here before, and we're glad to have him back, vice president of news at Google. Uh, in that role, he drives all of Google's strategies relating to the media system, oversees many of the new uh, news and media related products. Just recently, I guess, uh, AMP, the accelerated mobile page, um, he also helped found the Trust Project, um, and he's been involved in digital media since 1980, or as your online bio says, uh, since the days of steam-powered modems, and I would add uh, wood-fired uh, monitors. Uh, he, is, he helped found Salon.com, has worked at Apple, the Home Network, uh, and uh, serves on the boards of the First Amendment Coalition, the International Center for Journalists, and the Shorenstein Center for Press Politics and Public Policy uh, at Harvard. So, uh, our panel. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm Gene Polisinski, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of the Museum Institute, and Sally Lerman, obviously, is the director, and also a, a, a longtime journalist who is uh, Peabody and a DuPont, uh, uh, Columbia DuPont Award, uh, covering largely medical technology, uh, and bioethics, uh, and I've got all and that science. right, in science. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's our, our respective backgrounds. I hung around the news business for a while and was helped start USA Today. Uh, that's the panel, and let me, Greg, start with you. Uh, if I could, I think, you know, one of the things that, that um, knowing ab about you, you represent that consumer, you represent that interest of the person to, to find something that's trustworthy in journalism. How does that drive what you do and the interest you had in the trust? Program? Yeah, I'm a, only a news consumer, not a professional. News is hard. I just want news I can trust. I want some confidence that when I open a newspaper, or whatever, that we've got professionals following uh, serious codes of ethics. And from my point of view, or uh, my simplistic point of view, the trust project includes things like, you know, it involves a commitment on the part of a news outlet to a code of ethics. Things like saying, uh, hey, we're not gonna make stuff up. It includes a diversity policy, things like they're gonna listen to everyone, including people of different <coughs> points of view, even ones you disagree with. And for that matter, since mistakes are inevitable, uh, there's a commitment to a uh, corrections policy and practice, meaning that if something goes wrong, and people make mistakes now and then, they're gonna fix them in a, like a real serious kind of way. So that's my uh, simple-minded point of view. Again, I'm a news consumer, I just want news I can trust. The Trust Project is part of the uh, foundation of 
let's say a revival in trustworthy news. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Shall we? Yeah, so let me ask Corey. Um, Corey, you were one of the people that I called early on and asked, would you be, would Mike be involved in this launch? And really asking for dedication and resources beyond um, just thinking about trust, but actually doing things to support trust. And you were so enthusiastic, in fact, had already been doing some things in that area. So can you talk a little bit about your efforts and about what, what it means to you and to Mike to be part of this collaboration? Sure. Um, well, it's exciting to for this to all be launched. Um, it's uh, so much hard work by a lot of really smart people, and I'm, um, I'm grateful to be a part of that and among all of you, and, and thanks for uh, the panel today. So before Mike knew of the Trust Project, we were actually working on something internally called the Transparency Project, which now we're just calling the Trust Project, and we've joined <laughs> uh, the group. Um, but the, the idea of transparency, I think, for Mike is where um, we actually started thinking about this kind of thing internally. Part of Mike's commitments overall, um, diverse perspectives, uh, very ruthless and, and radical transparency. These are things that are baked into the way we do our journalism. But what we, um, we also have a commitment <laughs> to not only thinking, thinking of these kinds of things ourselves, but of um, asking outside people what they think too. That's, and that's kind of um, this product and news mentality at Mike, which I think makes it very unique. And so we had this thesis, of course, this is the way we should conduct our journalism in a very transparent way. Um, that's part of how um, journalism actually news is gathered and then produced these days. Um, but what we found, we started to, we started talking to people about that, our actual consumers. We brought them in for focus groups. And what we found from there is that people didn't necessarily um, understand quite the sort of level of um, uh, sort of investigation or the fact-checking process or how we were being transparent, and by that I mean, you know, what we know now, what we don't know, what's still developing, what we're telling you, where our sourcing is from. Um, and many of us were like, oh, they don't know? I thought we were so clear in the way we're citing things and the way we do, have traditionally done journalism. Um, it was a very good gut check for us. And some very simplistic things, like, you know, I mean, people were telling us as we did these focus groups, I read your stories or I watch your videos and then I actually have to Google myself to find out as I do my own fact checking. Um, and it's like, huh, well the link's right. You know, so it was very, it was, it, it, so we took some very simple kind of product steps and I mean, and I, I, I won't elaborate on all of them, but um, many of them now are part of these trust indicators, which are um, it, citations at the bottom of a story uh, which I think is a is a much better way uh, to tell the user, you know, here here are the sources that I use. Here, you know, the, here's a transcript from the interview that I that I did. Um, primary sourcing, secondary sourcing, that kind of thing uh, makes a makes a big difference. And as you can see by just some of the early research that you did, uh, so that was baked into our thinking at Mike early on. And then when we understood what. Um, the trust project was undertaking. It was just kind of this match made in heaven, um, and we were fully on board and committed, um, and we're very happy to see all of that live. Very good. I should mention that uh, when we uh, sort of ask a question or two up here, we'll be going to some questions from you. Those of you watching the live stream uh, can uh, uh, send in your questions on Twitter, uh, and, uh, and then uh, we have mics on either side of the room here. Uh, we ask that no more than two or three people line up at a time. Uh, we may not have time to get to more questions than that, but uh, I want to start a stampede, but I just would rather not have you stand up there the whole time and not get to your question. So we'll go from there. But let me turn to my colleague, Lada uh, Not We uh, at the Museum, Museum Institute, have been thinking about this issue, and obviously in the First Amendment context it was mentioned uh, in the presentation by the Museum. Ed, and, and um, you know, there's a balance here, and, and I think, Craig, much like you, we came down this idea of, of for our part, looking at the idea that since the First Amendment belongs to all of us, what could consumers do? What could we give them as a tool? And so we've been looking around. Lada, would you talk for a moment about the idea we've, we've been percolating and talking with people about? Of course. Um, so one thing that's interesting about uh, the environment that we're in today is that a lot of people get their news from their Facebook news feeds or from their Twitter feeds. And sometimes it can actually be pretty difficult to know where a story is coming from. 
Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's something that's kind of unprecedented. It used to be that uh, even in the early days of the Internet, you would go to a website of a newspaper or a news outlet that you actually wanted to read, whereas with the uh, advent of the news feed, suddenly you'd have all these stories coming from everywhere, some coming from real legitimate news organizations, some coming from uh, organizations made up of Macedonian teenagers. You know, you didn't know. Um, so I think what we were thinking of is that what you need really isn't, uh, you don't want somebody to necessarily censor stories because they think they aren't true, because we don't really want anybody serving as the, uh, the person who decides what's true and what's false. That's a bit too philosophical for, for us, we think. Um, but what you do want is just a little information about where something is coming from and uh, who is behind it. And so, you know, kind of like a nutritional profile, uh, something that would tell you, uh, say, what news outlet is the story from? Where is it headquartered? Uh, what is its stated mission statement? Because a lot of uh, news outlets um, that spread sort of uh, viral salacious stories have in their mission statements very deep down that they're actually a satirical outlet and that nothing they say should be taken seriously. So that's important information to know when you see a story in your feed. So things like that. And then after that, the consumer could make a decision on whether they wanted to click on the story or not. Kind of like when you see the nutritional information for a Twinkie, you make the decision about whether you want to eat it or not. Nobody's telling you not to, but it's, it's good to just know what goes into it uh, before you take a bite. Um, so because uh, we, we call this idea newstrition because we think it's clever and we're kind of obnoxious that way, but it's nice to, to just know what goes into things. And so that's something that uh, we've been tossing around for a while. And what's great about uh, like learning about the Trust Project is it's just wonderful for consumers to have these tools to figure out how much they should trust news and what goes into the news especially. I, I think some of the Trust Project indicators, it's like uh, it's like when you, you're doing a math test and somebody shows their work, you know? It's just, it just really gives you a lot more confidence in the results when you know exactly what went into it. And tools like that, tools like uh, the new media literacy program that Catherine Cozen was talking about, these are all just wonderful things because we do live in this world where there's just so many sources of information and it can be so hard to parse what's what. And uh, I, uh, I work here at the museum at the First Amendment Center. And the other day I was on the top floor where we have our front pages gallery, where we have front pages of newspapers from all over the world and all over the United States. And I, I walked by these two kids who were clearly on a fake news scavenger hunt. And one of them said, all of these are true. All of these have to be true because they're new, they're, these are the stories in newspapers, so they must be true. Mm -hmm. And the other kid is like, no, they're all made up. It's all fake. Oh. And I was just thinking that, oh, man, we got to have you guys meet in the middle somewhere <laughs> where you should, not be, you should not be so cynical that you think that everything you read is fake, and nor should you accept every single thing you read at face value. Because, you know, sometimes we lose sight that the purpose of the press is to keep us informed so we make the best possible decisions. And you don't get that if, uh, if you're drowning in fake news, if you're unable to tell what's real from what's fake, if you, can't, if you decide not to trust anything. And so I think that projects like this just really help restore that confidence in what you read. And confidence in yourself, honestly, to figure out what you want to believe and what you want to dismiss. Yeah. So and what's one of the wonderful things is when I first talked with you, Lotto, about the, your idea with the news Christian, the trust indicators were well on their way and we were about to launch and what was so neat about it was there were, there were very similar elements like the ones that you just mentioned. I think they're pretty much all covered. So I wanted to um, talk with Richard and ask Richard Gingras to um, tell us a little bit about his perspective. Now Richard, you were one of the first couple people I talked to about the trust project and this idea of turning algorithms for the good instead of for cat videos. And you were not only very supportive, but you became a you know, real advocate for it. And with all your experience in um, starting companies, also offered me a lot of great advice. So, and convinced Google to use these. So tell me, tell us a little bit about what you see as the platform's role in this enterprise. Certainly. And, and first of all, uh, congratulations. It's been three years since we had those conversations. <laughs> and in fact, when we... When we collaborated on an article for Medium that sort of introduced the notion, and our objective, Sally's objective, was let's start a conversation. Uh, but we had a conversation. I said, well, like, we should give it a name. And so we called it the Trust Project, even though it wasn't a trust project. It wasn't a project yet. But <laughs> we figured, like, well, if we actually make it seem like a project and if people are interested, it'll become one. See, there's you, the expertise. You, you didn't need to pull that off. You had trust in us. Um, <laughs> we have trust. You know, so 
Interestingly, I think all of us here, because we have a, a strong sense of belief in the First Amendment and free expression, I think it's an important point of context to recognize that the internet, in and of itself, is the full embodiment of free expression. It's, in a sense, the First Amendment come to life. And if we, you know, and those of us who defend the First Amendment, we always make sure to point out that defending the First <coughs> Amendment means accepting the fact that there will be information out there that each and every one of us, in our own way, are uncomfortable with. Um, and indeed, if you need any proof of that, then you can just look at the internet today. There's obviously a lot of information you can be uncomfortable with. And indeed, it's a maelstrom of expression in many regards. And so I think the challenge for all of us from that, the challenge for Google, the challenge for news organizations, is how do we help our users, in a sense, separate the wheat from the chaff, you know, the, the, the truth from fiction, the, the wisdom from spin? Uh, these are obviously very, very, very difficult challenges, and I think the Trust Project is an important effort, uh, in my mind, to, to really rethinking the architecture of information and how we present it to our users. So, to that point, the question of, you know, how does, wh why does this matter to Google? It matters usually to Google because, of course, we have billions of users coming to us every day for information, um, and, and they trust us, and we want them to trust us. Uh, even though, as the very nature of a search engine, we will indeed surface information that you will be uncomfortable with because it's there and because it can be found. But we also believe that we can do and can always do a better job in how we address these things. So, you know, at core, when, when I look at this, I say, like, well, how do we give our own users? There's a lot of talk today about media literacy. And media literacy largely comes down to how do I understand the expertise behind a piece of information and the underlying motivation of the person who's propagating it? And so what I think from our end is, is how do we help our users in looking at search results or looking at a list of articles in Google News, how do we help them understand the expertise and underlying motivation of each piece of content? That's perfection. We won't get there, but we need to try. So there are three areas that, uh, that we will begin to take advantage of, of the effort to the Trust Project. One, you may notice uh, when you go to search, often we will surface what we call knowledge cards uh, about an organization, about an entity, about an individual. Um, these are important. And we want to use these when it comes to publications to provide greater degrees of transparency about the organization. Uh, in a sense, we've been using the term, the phrase internally, nutrition labels. <coughs> and I use that because it's not a good housekeeping seal approval that says this is good or bad. It says, no, here's the ingredient information you need to know about the publication. Make your own judgment. So, you know, should those knowledge cards about USA Today or, or Mike have, you know, here's the editorial masthead, here are the editors, who owns the publication, for instance? So greater transparency about the organization in and of itself. We think that's one step. So that's one, the knowledge cards about publications. Second is, back to literacy, understanding motivation is, as you know, in the world of, of, of news today, you see all kinds of articles when you go to the Washington Post, the New York Times, and some of them are news coverage that is, you know, that is there with the objective of fact-based knowledge. Uh, and then there are opinions and perspective pieces, all kinds of different expression. Um, and so there, too, we want to help our users have a better sense of what it is they're looking at. So, for instance, understanding what type of article is this. Is it news coverage or is it an opinion piece is important? And we want to be able to present that to our users in that way. You know, when I look at Google, Cer when at Google Search, when it comes to news, there's a philosophy that I look to drive, which is this. We don't know the answers when it comes to many current event issues. There are no answers. There are perspectives. And so, the, to us, the objective is, is how do we give our users the tools and information they need to form their own critical thinking based on information that we present that's assiduously apolitical such that they can form, hopefully, their more informed opinions about each subject, right? So how do we use a better understanding of the types of articles they see to convey more information to the user about where this author is coming from? And last, and, and by no means least, we rank content, we rank articles in Google News, we rank articles in Google Search and in all of our other services. So what we're looking for and what the Trust Project, it, we, what we love about the Trust Project is the opportunity to get more what we think of as ingredient information to help us understand the article, right? Now we just understand the context, the text of the article. Can we understand more about the author, more about the body of the work of the author? 
You know, I would much rather give an edge to a reporter, for instance, who works on that beat all the time, you know, who all they do is cover national surveillance. That matters. So can we understand more about the author? Can we more understand more citations, for instance, that might support the conclusions that the author reached with the article? These things will all be, I think, immensely helpful to us as we evolve our systems to help understand the nature of the underlying content and do a better job of giving the user not only the highest quality, most authoritative information we can find, but give them also the additional indicators or signals to help them make their own determination as to what they're seeing and how they take that knowledge and actually help themselves be good citizens, right? I mean, my favorite definition of journalism is how do we give citizens the, the tools and information they need to be good citizens? And that's why this effort is so important and why it's so important that Google work with the industry to do an increasingly better job at accomplishing just that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to come back to Craig and to Sally both and then in actually invite everybody else to respond as well, but uh, from a consumer standpoint, you know, the, the, the task is really formidable today with the flow of information. I, you know, the Wall Street Journal did a piece today about Google search and uh, talking about e with trillions of searches on a given day, I think, that, you know, saying there, even if there are a tiny percentage that are not uh, the way, you know, maybe the best information, that's millions of searches that don't produce that. But just looking at the task of that, I mean, trillions of searches a day, uh, the consumer looking for that kind of validity that I think we all want. Um, it, it really comes down to, in a, in a way, uh, having read that piece, is, the, is, is it possible to bring back, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping that it can, but is it possible to bring back the trust? Is it possible to do, for, for the majority of pieces, for the majority of readers, to bring back that trust? And I, and I, I, I'm in no way trying to diminish the value of all the work being done. But I, I worry with all of the, the access to information now on news sites, on Google, on, on any number of places, can we really defeat this, this monster that we've created in a way? Uh, I'm optimistic about it because uh, this is one of a bunch of efforts where people who really know journalism have gotten together to basically uh, practice what they preach in terms of good principles of journalism. And also there's groups forming to better understand and then to counter things like media manipulation and information warfare. Um, for example, at Pointer Institute, there's the International Fact Checking Network, including PolitiFact and uh, Snopes.com. The deal is, is to form a countable network of networks of fact checkers who show how they arrived at their conclusions. Their job will be to keep uh, news outlets honest, so if a news organization signs up for trust project principles, which basically are saying, hey, we can be trustworthy, the fact checkers can keep them uh, honest. The advertisers are concerned too. They're forming the open brand safety uh, network, or s set of standards, wherein a bunch of people from the advertising industry are trying to figure out what are some of the hate sites or fake news sites that advertisers don't want their ads on. It goes on a while from there, and I can go on and on about it. But that's the kind of reason why I'm uh, optimistic about this, because lots of good people are getting together to stand up for good journalism, and then also to uh, battle the people who are trying to turn journalism into a, uh, oh, into a battlefield. Me, my job is to put my money where my mouth is. <laughs> you know, it, it did take us. 50 years, 60 years, 80 years to develop a, a rigor of trustworthiness in the in the mediums that we've had for a long time. You know, the, the, we all know about yellow journalism. We know about the way a lot of media started out. Is the trust project going to be the tipping point to get us on that road for the, the kind of solution for the long term? Well, of course, you know, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Yeah. But, but in what way? In a, in a way, I mean, it, this seems to have a very broad base of support yeah. that a lot of other operations don't have. Well, what I see is so powerful about this effort is that it really does come from this marriage between what we're hearing from the public and what people want to know and what they feel that they need to understand in order to trust journalism and traditional journalistic values that have been built up over that time that the sen these senior news executives brought to the table. Thinking about those two together and then thinking about, okay, what is it that we can offer in this new digital space that really will help people 
assess what they're looking at and make better choices. There, there was a presumption when I started out, or even when we started USA Today in 82, that there was a certain degree of trust we could count on, that if we were in the marketplace and did a decent job, there would be a trust following. But you had to obviously worry about that right from the startup yeah. of your organization. Interesting that you would put, build that into the system right from the start. Yeah, I think, um, one, I just generally am very optimistic about our industry. Sure, business models notwithstanding and all of that. It's complicated. There is that um, but the amazing thing is that there are so many people that are engaged and interested in news. It's incredible, actually. Um, recently did some, some research and found that um, in, U in the U.S. alone that consumers are spending 1.5 billion hours a month on what I would call this new visual <laughs> tap to engage, tap through, Snapchat-like, Facebook video, slideshow-y kind of formats. That's incredible, 1.5 billion hours a month. It's huge. And um, I, for me as a publisher, Mike is, we're close to six years old. Um, we reach 70 million people a month. That's unique people, 70 million people a month. That's incredible. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years, there was no way that a six-year-old news organization could reach that many people. So just, I will just say I think there. We hit three million after six years. Right, so it's it's an amazing it's an amazing time. Um, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that if you reach that many people. So the journalist in me knows that okay, this is incredible, but this is a real privilege, and there's a huge responsibility when you're reaching that many people. So yes, we actually did bake those ethics and standards and ideals and norms and the way, uh, I mean, I think some of the the magic for me, of, uh, Mike, and I, I think um, I think what draws people uh, actually to work there is very much this idea of merging the, the, the professional journalism standards with these modern ways to, to do stories and to sort of adaptive um, storytelling together. So it has to be baked in. Um, and I, you know, the, the thing is our audiences they check us. They actually call us out. Looking at the comment, we'll post a video, um, you know, revealing certain things about what's happening in the alt right and these kind of hidden in plain sight things that are happening. And then we immediately have these comments where people are asking us questions. They want more information. Uh, that's an amazing thing. They're looking for it. They're hungry for it. And as soon as we are um, not playing by the right kind of rules, we get called out. There, there is a authenticity um, that is expected, at least by the audiences that we've built at Mike. So it, it, I think it has to be to be baked in. Yeah, I think if there's a common thread through the programs we've been doing here since we opened. It's that idea that uh, technology changes a great deal, interests change a great deal, personalities on the political stage and so social stage change a great deal. But the thread of success is credibility. That's the currency in the 21st century. For news organizations are going to survive. That seems to be a, a thread from program to program to program. I would invite, again, a limited number of you to go to microphones if you can uh, to ask a question. We want to move to that. And here goes the rush. Great. No <laughs> sharp questions. elbows if we can. But uh, we'll just go right to those if it's yeah, okay with you, ahead. Sally. Please. We're going to start yeah. right here and then we'll go. There's another mic over here for those yes, of you on that side of the room. But uh, if you just give us a, a sense of if you represent a group or, or who you are, just we've done the same. So give us a sense of the context of your question and keep and the question brief. I'm Samuel Breslow with the Student Press Law Center. Um, one of the uh, things that really stood out to me from earlier was the uh, statistic that so many people share news articles without even going to read them. Yeah. Um, and that makes me worry that the issue here is um, to a large extent uh, not that people are making a dedicated effort to determine the credibility of a news piece before sharing it, but that the credibility doesn't matter as much to them in the first place as whether the piece of news aligns with their partisan viewpoints that they already have. So my question for anyone on the panel who wants it then is how do you go about trying to um, deal with consumers who just have so little interest in the first place in determining whether a piece of news is credible? It's a huge challenge. I mean, and you, you, you hit on a core thing. I mean, like when we look at the decline in trust, oh, sorry. when we look at the decline in trust, this didn't start with the internet. It started back in the mid last mid, you know, in the seventies, and it's been declining ever since. And what you, one thing you can track against that is the increase of partisan media, uh, and that's you know that's covered under the First Amendment as well. But to your point, there's no question. People much prefer affirmation than information, which is what drives them to do exactly what you said. Um, 
So there, there are no easy solutions here. I mean, again, I think we, to some degree, we need to rebuild our institutions, including our news institutions, rethink what does it mean to be a news institution. At Google, what does it mean to be a search engine in this time and context? You know, how do we, how do we help guide people uh, with better signals about what they're reading? No one, I think, wants to share information that's known to be wrong. The question is, is how do you intercept them in such a way that they're willing to accept that, oh, maybe I was wrong and I shouldn't share this, right? I think the fact check mod model is very powerful and particularly, I think, very useful in areas like Google search, right? And not just news, but for instance, medical information. If someone looks up peach pits cure cancer, you'll find sites that tell you it does. You know, but can we insert a fact check module, say, for the Mayo Clinic that says, oh, by the way, you know, maybe not? <laughs> so, Again, very, very hard problems to solve, but it, you, what you hit on is at the core of the issue today. Um, from my point of view, if you're looking at your social, uh, social media feed and you're considering uh, sharing something, you might want to see a badge or indicator of some sort which says, hey, these guys uh, signed up for the Trust Project. They do fact checking. They uh, almost always get it right. And when they get it wrong, they fix it. On the other hand, uh, Maybe they'll see an item floating by which says, uh, hey, uh, before you uh, share this, this one looks iffy. They never signed up for the trust project. They get a lot of things wrong. And when you call them on the things, they don't bother to fix it. That's uh, one way to approach it, which, uh, which would really work for me. And I have to give the hat tip for Jeff to Jeff Jarvis, who first floated an idea related to that. And he's the guy who uh, lured me into the trust project, <laughs> as well as other places. And the asking of awkward questions to people on panels. Uh, <laughs> and we go, I think go this side, sure. Um, I'm just curious, has Fox News, Sinclair Group, uh, Drudge Report, Breitbart, have any of those kinds of organizations signed up for the trust project? So the way the trust project it works is that Collaborators across, first of all, we're nonpartisan. So collaborators across the news industry have been working together to come up with the indicators. The first 14 that worked, or 15 actually, that worked on the launch, and then the nine that are actually implementing, do include, I mean, most of them would say they are nonpartisan. They do include a conservative publication. So the idea really is that if you, are, as a news organization, provide these types of information, then users can understand where you're coming from. And that's been one of the problems up till now is that people don't particularly understand if there is a stance behind the news or not. Okay, we'll go over this side. Uh, Anders Gyllenhaal uh, with McClatchy. And this is a little bit of a follow-up on that question, which is that you know, political division seems to be behind an awful lot of of what's going on. Politics seems to allow us to pick and choose what we want to believe. So the question is, what, how, how much research, how much of a part did this play in, in what you put together? Do you think there are answers to some of that division in, in what you're coming up with? Well, what I learned through this research, and it was research done by several, maybe four researchers in the US and Europe, and the very encouraging part was that there are, there are different sets of publics. And there is a one set, of, there are a couple sets of public that are um, very interested in seeking out quality news and going across the divide. And the, the most active I call the AVID group. And they're out there, whatever their political persuasion, really trying to understand what's going on in the world, or like Wendy said, what's going on in our neighborhood, checking and cross-checking. And so I put my faith into those, that group and the group of engaged users who also want to be informed but maybe don't want to have put that much effort into it or don't have the time, those folks can be the ones who can start to shift the picture and can start to pull people together across this divide. Because part of what we need is for the public, members of the public really to start talking to one another about news and let news be um, like that one of our survey questions said, let it be a focus of conversation, a focus of exchange across ideologies. And I, I'm hopeful that we can do that. Be before we go to this side, uh, yeah. we do have a question on Twitter. Um, and it, it, it sort of follows, it's interesting, following the, first, the last two questions, projecting a year into the future, what does success look like for the Trust Project? 
Now it's always tough when you're launch day, but uh, but, uh, but one Let's year, five Corey. years. Let's ask. Uh, so. Well, so what we're doing is rolling out in, in, in a controlled way to make sure that we really are careful about how this is implemented, um, whether it's implemented properly from the standpoint of the technical vocabulary so that the um, platforms are able to, their machines are able to read it, and also so that the front end, the news publishers who are participating actually provide the information that they collectively decided was important. So the first year we'll be building that and also making it more, making it possible for smaller, less resources, resourced organizations to participate. Then five years, 10 years, I don't know how long it will take, but I really hope that the public side of this, not only do we see great, you know, everybody using this in terms of the news organizations, but we also see everyone using it in terms of the public, that people really start noticing these indicators. I hope that happens within a year, but that we start seeing them become a standard for people to think about and assess what is the quality of this information that they're looking at and how to share it. And um, I think that it can grow and really become a positive force. Question over here. Thank you very much. This is great. Um, Joan Michelson, uh, Green Connections Radio. Can you, is it on? Okay. Um, a kind of an interesting follow-up to that and, uh, and a follow-up to that <coughs> is um, when you're doing the survey, you said it's random by a, by a traditional, if you will, research group, but there are, how do you profile that? I mean, there, you know, I don't, I'm concerned that you might be getting bias in your survey in terms of the use of it. And um, how do you deal with anonymous sources in a story? How do you talk about, how do you, if you're building trust, right? There's this whole ethos now around anonymous sources not inherently being trustworthy because they don't want to be revealed. So how do you contend with that to still build trust in it? So l let me take those um, separately. So the first was about our research, the other was about anonymous, and actually Corey might, Did I'm gonna kick him to yeah. Corey too after I finish because I'd be interested in her opinion about what this should look like in five years and also about the anonymous sources. So in terms of the research, I wanna be clear that we did two kinds of research. So the first research was actually design-oriented interviews. So they were one-on-one -on -one interviews and we use the snowball process where you start with one person and then you look for other people and continue on through that process or just try to find people who um, this, these researchers were able to find across different, we, we, I asked them to look across race, cro gender, generation, geography, and also ideology. So we were really looking for that in our um, interviews. In the survey, or it actually was an experiment, it wasn't a survey, um, in the study, that is a population that is put together by a research group. And so they, I mean, they vet everybody so that they make sure that they have a very um, broad-based population to do that research in. So I'm, I'm confident that it does cut across a, a, a wide swath of perspectives and backgrounds. Just to be clear, that's the group that you showed had the 52% increase? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and if anybody wants more information on that study and the organization that did, I'd be happy to give you that. Yeah. And uh, Corey, you do have a policy on... Uh, we do. We, we do have a policy anonymous on sourcing. anonymous sourcing as well as an entire editorial standards policy that is published, which is part of one of the uh, indicators for the, um, the trust project. But I'll just, I'll, I'll quickly cite some of it because I think it, it's important. And it, look, using anonymous sourcing should always be... Um, as rare as possible, um, but w we do use it on occasion um, to ensure the safety of the source, um, to protect professional standing of the source, to enable the source to talk freely about sensitive and potentially illegal topics like sex or drugs, uh, and there's a few other criteria. Um, we recently uh, did a video uh, where we uh, fully masked a source and uh, changed his voice and made sure that even if, because there are ways of undoing those things to figure out, uh, went through a, a very rigorous process to make sure that the source wasn't identifiable. In this case, it was um, someone who runs an influencer network who was describing actually how um, fake news is produced. So we needed, we needed to protect him um, in, in a major way, and we did. So uh, it's rare, but we do have standards, and uh, we're pretty rigorous. When there is a case where we would use anonymous sourcing, we're making sure that there's a, there's, and that is elevated, and that, that, that's a choice. 
Okay, but my question was how are you integrating it into the trust project? I, I think to tie it back to the trust project is this. I think we all recognize that at times there is a need to use anonymous sources, right? Just as at times the, the leaks are extraordinarily valuable. But I think in both of those, that's where you step back as a reader and you want to know, can I trust a reporter who's conveying uh, the anonymous source? Can I trust the publication that that reporter works for? So you look at the, you look at the chain of trust uh, of the source of information, not simply the fact that the information itself might be from an anonymous source. I also think you're looking at the industry just writ large, uh, either a tendency to pull back where it's not necessary, not to offer it so often, but also to identify layers where you used to just say, according to an unnamed source, you'll now find an unnamed source who has worked on the project for six years but is not authorized. You know, where you begin to give the reader at least some understanding of what that source is. Is it a disgruntled employee or is it somebody, again, who's been involved for six years in the project, a project, but is not authorized to speak publicly. That's become a common phrase. So I think you're seeing a little bit of shift even within that ethos within the ethics of the industry. But having that trust, it all does come down to trust. Ultimately, it will come down to trusting the institution that brings you that news. I think we have time to go to those two questions and, uh, and, and, and we'll go Going on. Going back to the very early presentation, Sally's presentation, one question about the 32% trust of media. I would have trouble answering one question with a term such as so broad as the media, does that mean Breitbart or the Washington Post or the New York Post or uh, PBS NewsHour? And the other question is on something like the Trust Project, are you concerned about people counterfeiting being trustworthy, where it ranges from putting up the logo to building a whole structure, uh, a nested multi page website where it's all nonsense. Uh, given the extent that it now people are going to, to fake <coughs> news, that's certainly not beyond the realm of possibility. To duplicate all of the trust indicators that you described and yet be making up news. Yeah, I, and, and honestly, I think one of the answers, and you should be more specific, is it doesn't stop the U.S. Mint from printing money because somebody counterfeits it. I mean, there, there will be that effort, I suspect, and you've anticipated some of that, I think. So. Yeah, so to start with, that's why we're doing a very controlled rollout with and really vetting all the organizations that have participated. And I see Adam sitting in the front row there. But you could attest that each one, we've gone through both the back end um, tagging and also the front end to make sure everything is there for the user that we've asked for. So we will continue to do that. Um, and you're right that there there always is the concern that we might see fakery here. And so there's a couple, there are a variety of ways we can address that right now. Um, and I'm, Richard can speak to this, but the, the technology platforms that are using these have their own systems already in place for quality control. So you may want to speak to that. Um, from our end, it really is a complex project to, in order to implement these trust indicators. So that will be one barrier. And you know, there will, as we go forward and scale, then there will be other things that we put into place. Uh, you know, since the founding of Google, we've had to fight spam, people who look to trick the search engine. So I go into this with the full expectation that what you suggest will occur that there will indeed be sites that present them. There are sites out there today that present themselves as news organizations in one form or another that will present all the right trust marks, all the right policies, and so on and so forth. Clearly, you know, looking at it from our end, that's the stuff that we always have to figure out, right? How do we triangulate? How do we find a, How do we develop an understanding of an underlying domain? Uh, how do I understand that that reporter who declares is, who claims to be David Farentold is David Farentold? Uh, so you, you can't go into these challenges without recognizing that that kind of, of effort will happen. And so what you simply then do, at least as a search engine, is build up your defenses and approaches to ferreting that out so that you're tricked as, 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 as infrequently as possible. But it's an imperfect game. It's an arms race. Hi. Last question. Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to share my thoughts and experience about uh, this question. So. I'm 20 years old, uh, I'm from France, I'm French, and I have a YouTube channel. And on this YouTube channel, I talk about news, I talk about politics, and my objective is like to explain news basically to uh, young people. So I do some five minute videos when I take a subject and I just try and explain it for young people. And so now I do this on YouTube, it has close to 200,000 subscribers. I do it on Instagram where there's about 30,000 subscribers on the chatbot on Messenger too. So I try and do it on various ways. And 
what is interesting is that I never get questions like, I never get questions like, what are your sources? Or who are you to talk about those subjects? Even though I'm 20 years old and, like, and I haven't finished my studies and I'm still studying. And like, I find it very interesting to see that the young audience that's watching my videos, so they're like, I don't know, 15 to 20 years old, I guess the average is around those years. They don't ask those questions. Those questions, they are asked by journalists who interview me like about my channel or about friends of my parents or like older people. Okay. Um, and question. yeah, so, so I just wanted to know what you thought about this, like the fact that there's this um, young people don't seem to care much about this question. And I think what happens on my on my channel is like people, all the comments I get are like, you're not like this media. You're not telling fake, okay. fake news like this media. Okay. I think we've got a sense yeah. of, you know, I, I, I'll just start off by saying I, they should ask you uh, as the oldest guy. And they, they should ask. They should but but what yeah. about the rest of the panel? What, what do you, how do you want to respond no, I to that? Well, I would say that it sounds like, well, first of all, you aren't like most news outlets in that, you know, you're kind of a, an independent person with a YouTube channel. And it sounds like you have subscribers who, and while well, I agree with Gene, they should probably ask where you're getting your information from. That's important. You probably have built a certain amount of credibility with the people who follow you regularly. Well, I don't know, but the funny thing is, sometimes, or most of the time, I, get, I put the same information as mainstream media. So it's funny that sometimes you, I get some comments of young people saying, you're not selling, saying like this media who's telling fake news, when I'm just saying the exact same thing, maybe in a different way, way like with my own words, but still the same facts. So it's quite interesting this like, yeah, distrust and like, yeah, in, in media. So that's just my thought I wanted to share about this. Well, great, thank you. And this has been such an interesting conversation discussion. And I, I thank you members of the audience for being open to learning about the Trust Project, to listening to our, all the panelists who have some connection with working in this area of building trust in the news. And I just want to thank each of our panelists, Lada, Craig, Corey, and Richard, and Jean for hosting and well, co-moderating. So thank you very much. We're delighted to do this. As an as a, as a institution very interested in this and talking about the First Amendment, we hope that you'll continue to look at museuminstitute.org uh, to follow developments of the Trust Project and other mechanisms by which people are trying to rebuild trust in journalism. So again, thank you very much. Thank you for those of you watching the live stream. <laughs>